Hello and welcome to the Arctic Summer College. This is our second last session for this year. And uh, of course, that's uh, almost, almost a little bit of an emotional moment in the, in the series. Uh, it's not the, not the last session, so we can still enjoy it and be very productive and uh, focused on, on the content. And um, I hope that you will have, well, a lot of fun in this session, but also learn something. Uh, feel free to ask questions. As usual, you can ask your questions anytime during the presentation, uh, either using the chat function or raising your hand or asking your question in the question function. So there's three ways how to do this. I'm sure you have figured this out by now. Um, yeah, and I hope that uh, you will also enjoy these presentations. We have first speaker of today is Heather. Heather exner Piro is uh, at the University of Saskatchewan and is uh, one of the editors of the Arctic Yearbook, is also on uh, numerous other journal editorial boards. She's also on the advisory board for the Arctic Institute. She does a lot of research in Arctic matters. And today she's gonna talk to us about the Arctic Council. And that's really exciting because uh, we talked always uh, a little bit, we, we touched on the Arctic Council in so many of these sessions in the past, but we never really, really talked about it that much. So Heather, this is really good because it would be really incomplete Arctic Summer College without talking about the Arctic Council and its working in details and maybe also about the future of, of it because that's also really interesting to see what's gonna happen with the Arctic Council in the future. And you can see already our next speaker is here, Jocelyn Jo Strack. I'm gonna introduce you in uh, full later on, but um, so you're gonna speak then about indigenous land use planning. And the fun fact is that you're both at the University of Saskatchewan. That's oh, the fun fact. <laughs> we so, should be in the same office, but didn't realize that. You, you should be, but I'll introduce you later so people don't, don't uh, forget it before you start talking. So now first speaker is Heather. And um, Heather, I would just say, go ahead, start your lecture. And um, later on, I'll come back on when we have then the Q&A session. All right, well, thank you, Max. And uh, thank you uh, for having me today. I was an Arctic Summer College Fellow in 2015 and got to go to uh, Arctic Circle Assembly, thanks to them. So this is near and dear to my heart. And I can see all of your chats if you do type messages. I think Max will relay them, but I can see them as well. So feel free to ask uh, any questions that you have and if I go too fast. Um, I do lots of Arctic things and the Arctic Council is, is maybe nearest and dearest, or maybe the nerdiest about the Arctic Council. So I'll try to keep this to about half an hour so we can have a half an hour of discussion and questions, but. We'll see, I get carried away sometimes. <clears throat> so what is the Arctic Council? According to them, uh, they're the leading intergovernmental forum promoting cooperation, coordination, interaction among the Arctic states, indigenous communities, and other Arctic inhabitants, in particular on issues of sustainable development and environmental protection. Um, so I'm sure you guys already know that there's the eight Arctic states. Um, and, and within the Arctic Council, there's six uh, permanent participants, which are Indigenous organizations, and I'll talk about them a little bit later, and they are intended to represent pretty much all Arctic Indigenous communities. Um, so it was, it was created in 1996, and I'll talk about the history a bit on the next slide, but things that you should know about the Arctic Council that maybe not everybody knows. First of all, it's a forum. So like it says, it's an intergovernmental forum, and so it's really meant just to be a place where the states and the Indigenous groups could talk and, and do some work and, and plan some things, and which is the point is it's not treaty based. Uh, so there's nothing binding the states to any kind of cooperation, any kind of activities, any kind of financial contributions, nothing like that. Uh, and the, it's kind of outlined what the Arctic Council is and, and what the states committed to in the Ottawa Declaration. Uh, and it, it's, you know, it's, it's a fairly vague document. 
I guess it's it's not vague in the sense that people don't know what's happening, but it wasn't it wasn't meant to be a very prescribed kind of organization. Um, so NATO, for example, would be a treaty-based organization, um, and then you know there's certain commitments on the part of states that that they all uh, appreciate and acknowledge and follow. But with the Arctic Council, it's really just a, a, a commitment to get together every two years and work on these issues of sustainable development and environmental protection. And that means that institutionally, if everyone's in political science. Uh, or governance out there. Institutionally, it's quite a weak organization uh, in that sense that uh, doesn't have much of a legal character. Um, and, and, but that, you know, that leads to good things and bad things. So on top of it being only, uh, only a forum, it is also consensus-based. So there are, there are no votes on anything. Either all eight states agree to something or, or all eight states don't. So some things that, you know, seven states have agreed to, for example, at the last ministerial in 2017, um, the European Union, uh, probably probably all the countries except for Russia, would probably be pretty happy to have it now be an observer. In 2013, Canada and Russia, neither of them wanted the EU, um, for Canada was an issue of the, of the seal hunt and the EU ban on seal products. But because Russia doesn't agree in 2017 that the European Union should be an observer, then it isn't. Uh, and it's not much discussion. So again, if one country um, vetoes something, they can certainly do that. And that was built right in. Of course, this was a negotiation with the United States and Russia and then the six other states in the 90s to try to get this form going. And they weren't willing to, you know, to be able to be overruled. Um, so it's developed as, as a consensus-based institution. The other side of that, people often talk about the permanent participants or the six indigenous organizations and how they participate and how they engage. And I've heard people say, well, they don't have a vote. And it's, you know, it's true they don't have a vote and that, the, you know, it is an intergovernmental forum so that the states do have some, some priority, I would say. Uh, but because it's consensus-based and because a lot of the decisions get made in this group of 14 people, the eight senior Arctic officials from the eight states and the six head of de delegations from the PPs, uh, it, it, is, it would be very rare. I've never heard of an instance where the permanent participants, all six of them were opposed to something, and the eight Arctic states went ahead and did it anyways. So because it is consensus-based, um, everybody pretty much agrees with everything that it does, and things can be slow, for sure, because of that, and things can be watered down, for sure, because of that. But on the other hand, everybody is always on board with everything the Arctic Council does. How's my audio, Max? It just said I was lost and restored, so. No, we heard you fine. Okay. There was some hiccups okay. in between, but I think we heard all your words pretty okay. fine. Thank Perfect. you. All right, so the other thing that in kind of in an asterisk, in a, in a footnote in the 1996 Ottawa Declaration establishing the Arctic Council is it said the Arctic Council should not deal with matters related to military security. And I think a lot of the news, popular news, mainstream media about the Arctic, certainly in the last 10 years, has been about you know geopolitics in the Arctic and, and Russia versus the West, and pe lots of people have argued that you know it either either they think that it does deal with military security or they think that it should deal with military security. That like what's the what's the purpose of having these eight Arctic states get together if they can't talk about you know these very critical kind of tensions and dynamics? Uh, but explicitly, it doesn't deal with military security, and that was built in in the 90s. Um, you know, as as you all know. Soviet Union had just collapsed, um, and there was a lot of negotiations on nuclear disarmament, on securing Russia's nuclear arms, and there was a lot of bilateral negotiations between the United States and Russia at that time in the 90s. And there are also other fora, you know, NATO um, and, and some other kind of Russian, um, Western kind of forums to deal with, exclusively deal with disarmament. And so the United States in particular, I'm sure Russia agreed, felt that they didn't want to carry that over into the Arctic Council, that there were enough um, you know, places to discuss military security, and that this Arctic Council was really going to be on the soft issues, environment and protection, sustainable development, what I like to call kind of motherhood and apple pie kinds of discussions. And now people, again, like I said, people often say, oh, it should deal with military security. That's a big, big gap kind of in, in what it does. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of people like myself would argue that because it couldn't deal with military security, it's really been able to weather, for example, Crimea uh, in 2014 or Georgia in 2008. 
that it, it wasn't allowed to interfere with the work because they weren't talking about those things anyways. Whereas some other, um, for example, there was a, a chief of staff, Arctic chief of staff meetings, they had had held two, it was an ad hoc forum, but that had to be canceled or it's been, you know, delayed in, uh, indefinitely uh, after, after Russia invaded Crimea. And so, you know, some things had to be stopped because of Crimea and because of Ukraine and because the, the way that the West thought that Russia was violating international law. But the Arctic Council didn't deal with those things, so it didn't really affect it as much. It also says that it should not deal with matters. Um, but when the Arctic Council is chosen to, it deals with issues pretty close to that. So, for example, they've dealt a lot with search and rescue. And uh, for a lot of the Arctic states, search and rescue is, is part of a, you know, the Department of Defense. It's a defense responsibility. For some of them, it's, it's more of a police constabulary function. And for others, it falls under defense, and they still manage to deal with search and rescue. And under the auspices of the Arctic Council, certain Arctic, Arctic, uh, Arctic Coast Guard Forum. So again, it hasn't stopped them from dealing with, with kind, you know, kind of pseudo-military matters when it suited all parties, and everyone was interested in that. Uh, the Arctic Council focuses in particular on issues of sustainable development and environmental protection. And it's often uh, discussed that Canada had, was really the one that pushed the issue of sustainable development. Um, that the, all the other countries were kind of on board with environmental protection. Again, this was in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, especially in kind of the Barents area uh, and on the, the peninsula between Mermaids and the Scandinavian countries. There was a, a lot of you know, environmental challenges. Um, and, and that was what everyone was very interested in, that, those kinds of things. I mean, everyone is always very interested in environmental protection in the Arctic. Um, but it's Canada that pushed this idea of sustainable development in particular. And I'll talk about the negotiations in, in a second. But it also, so it's, it's, it's narrow, I guess, is the point of that. Because people often think of the Arctic Council as doing everything and all things Arctic. But its mandate is really limited to those two things, sustainable development and environmental protection. Um, so, you know, there's a, a lot of things that other regional organizations would talk about, borders or trade or immigration um, or, you know, economic or, or business kinds of things that the Arctic Council doesn't and really shouldn't uh, under its current terms of reference discuss. And just a little bit on, on how it operates in the Ottawa Declaration, it identifies that they should meet every two years. Uh, so that's the ministers, generally a ministerial level, meeting every two years. So, of course, the Fairbanks ministerial was just held in May when the United States was chair. And at this time, there's always a ministerial declaration that kind of identifies the Arctic Council's priorities and actions and, and those kinds of things. The Arctic Council is organized on the basis of chairmanships, rotating chairmanships, so that every two years or so, one of the eight countries um, takes over the chair. So Canada, of course, started in 1996 until 1998, and you know there was a whole order of, of the chairs in that row, and then we're we're seeing that cycle again. So Canada started the second cycle in 2013. The United States, which was the chair between 98 and 2000, has taken over the chair for this period, and then Finland, uh, who followed the uh, United States in 2000, will also follow the United States this time. It says normally every two years, um, you know, sometimes it's off by a month or two. Um, depending on, you know, the weather or, or people's commitments. So that Canada's chairmanship ministerial was in April and the United States was in May. Uh, but there was one time the Norwegian ministerial was almost three years, uh, three years long um, for a number of different reasons and mostly to do with, you know, logistics. And the Arctic Council wasn't as important, I guess, or as high up on people's agendas at that time. Uh, so the logistics and the weather and when to meet uh, was able to trump uh, how long the ministerial uh, chairmanship was, which I don't think would happen today. Yeah, I don't think Iceland would wait another six or, or, or 12 months. Um, so I think that won't happen again, but that was the one blip where it wasn't just two years. So that's what the Arctic Council is. They put together this um, logo of the structure, which I don't think is a, a, a really a perfect structure. Um, because it has the working groups on the same level as the member states and the PPs, which isn't really how it functions. But as you can see, there's eight member states, and it is an intergovernmental forum. And so it really is of and for states. 
but as you also know, they've, they've certainly made a lot of space for the Indigenous uh, permanent participants, those six. And in practice, just about everything the Arctic Council does on a decision-making basis involves those six groups quite closely. Um, and then there's six working groups, and they do the work of the Arctic Council, and I have them listed on the next slide. Um, but I would think that they were, you know, if I were to represent this visually, they're a subsidiary to the, the member states and the PPs. And they're a holdover from the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy of 1991, most of them. Um, and they were kind of absorbed into the Arctic Council in 1996. And then aside from that, you have observers. Um, and about a third of the observers are states. Some are NGOs and some are intergovernment organizations. And they don't do very much, actually. They can contribute somewhat to the working groups and to the work. Uh, but they don't participate in any decision-making uh, kind of capacity. So just to, to list these in a different way, there is a chair, um, and that's usually the foreign minister of whoever is, or the secretary of state of whoever is the country, uh, you know, that's holding the chairmanship. Uh, but there's also a senior Arctic official chair who really is in charge of setting the agenda, managing the agenda, um, you know, stewarding the, the Arctic Council over these two years. And uh, that's uh, Alexi Harkonnen uh, at this point. It was Dave Bolton uh, for the Americans. So there's the chair who was the, you know, the real chair, the foreign minister, and then the acting, really the, the chair of the senior Arctic officials who, who was really uh, stewards the, the Arctic Council. So each of the Arctic states have a senior Arctic official. Uh, and these represent, you know, it used to be maybe on a weekly basis in the early 2000s, it used to be really a, a portion of people's jobs uh, in the early days of the Arctic Council. But I think now for most of the senior Arctic officials, it's, it's a, a, the majority of their time is spent with the Arctic Council. Um, and they represent the stuff, as I say, on a day-to-day -day basis. There's also all the foreign ministries would also have other staff, maybe that um, you know, do the sustainable development or do particular working group stuff or do other political stuff working under them. And then the permanent participants are led by heads of delegation is what they're called. So we have SAOs and HODs, heads of delegation. And there are six. And now Inuit Circumpolar Council, um, Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North, and Sami Council were the original permanent participants. So in 1996, there were, there were only three PPs. Uh, but I think um, there was an expectation that these other groups would come online and, and, and at, at the political level they had been involved in, in some capacity, certainly in Canada. And it is interesting that uh, um, the Alleyloo, the Arctic Athabascan Council, which, and these are all North American, so the three that came on later are all North American groups, um, whereas, whereas uh, ICC and, and SAMI are maybe a, a bit more international, covering a few more countries. Raypon is the only one that's not international, it's only Russian, but uh, also the ICC, the Sami Council, and the Aleut also have Russian members. Actually, four of the six have Russian indigenous membership or, or a mandate, uh, even though Raypon is exclusively Russian. So <clears throat> Raypon doesn't cover all the indigenous peoples in Russia. And yeah, so, so the Aleut, AAC, and Gwich'in came on later um, uh, than the other three did. And, and then also, if you look at their organization and their structure, uh, the ICC, Raypon, and the Semi Council existed beforehand and existed for other reasons. And when the um, Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy came on and when the Arctic Council came on, they absorbed that as a responsibility of, of one of the many things that they do. But the other three, the Aleut, the Athabascan, and the Gwich'in, those particular councils really developed to be, um, you know, to, to be PPs on the Arctic Council. So their, their number one reason, raison d'etre, I guess, is to be on the Arctic Council. And there are other ways, you know, other um, tribal councils uh, or bands or that kind of thing, um, you know, that do the business of the Gwich'in or the Athabascan or the Aleut. But these particular organizations are international in nature and, and mandated to represent them at the Arctic Council. And so they're often smaller than the first three, uh, but less funded and, and uh, have, less institutionally strong in many, in many ways, only because you know, they're created afterwards for the one purpose. And then we have observers. Currently, there's 39. There's um, this issue. Observers have so, so little influence, really, in the work of the Arctic Council. 
And this is, you know, Russia maybe in particular, but certainly Canada and I think the United States have jealously guarded, um, you know, the ability of the Arctic states to run the Arctic Council. And, and maybe, you know, for reasonable, I think if, if you're in, in international relations theory, this is to be expected and it's a perfectly reasonable thing that they don't want to give up any of the power that they rightfully have to other states. Uh, but, but the whole observer question has been really overblown, I think, in all discussions of the Arctic Council. That it's, it's taken a lot of the air, a lot of the discussion for what is really a, a very minor role in the Arctic Council. Um, and so there are 13 non-Arctic states, and it started out, I think, with three or four. And most of the bigger European players who do Arctic science uh, were, were Arctic Council members by 2000. And then later on, we had the second wave after, after 2008, uh, when China applied, and then South Korea, Japan, India, um, Singapore, also Italy, now Switzerland, uh, becoming uh, observer states later. So in 2013, there was uh, several of the Asian countries were accepted along with Italy. And in this last uh, ministerial in Alaska, Switzerland was the only state that was accepted. I think Mexico also applied, and I forget what the third one was. No, maybe Mongolia, but only Switzerland was accepted. So there's 13 on Arctic states. They don't, the, the Arctic Council, the real decision making gets done at what they call executive meetings. And that's the 14, the eight SAOs and the six head of delegations of PP. So those are executive meetings and, and the real talk and real discussions happen there. But also every six months they have the regular SAO meetings where all the observers are invited uh, to attend. And at all the working groups, um, the observers and especially the non-Arctic states are, are certainly welcome to attend and certainly welcome to contribute if they have science or funding uh, that they contribute to the, the work of the working groups that of course it's always welcome. Uh, but they don't all attend all the time. Uh, their attendance can be quite inconsistent. And so, you know, on the one side, there's some push by the observers to be included more. And on the other hand, they haven't always, uh, you know, provided funding or provided support or provided even attendance and all these things. So there's a bit of give and take. There's 13 IGOs, and here, just as examples, I've listed the World Meteorological Organization. This year, the president is a Finn, and unsurprisingly, in the Finnish Arctic Council chairmanship agenda, meteorological cooperation is a priority. There's a standing committee of parliamentarians of the Arctic region, uh, the, the SC par there. And, uh, you know, and they should probably be more powerful than they are since they're a political body and not just a bureaucratic one. Uh, and UNEP, there's a couple of uh, United Nations organizations, for example, that watch. And then 13 NGOs, um, so some that you might be familiar with, UARCTIC, International Arctic Social Sciences Association, uh, International Arctic Science Council, and the WWF. And, and from all accounts, the WWF might be the most active um, non-SAO, non you know, the most active observer, um, even, even exceeding a lot of what some of the Arctic states do. But Greenpeace has applied and, and has always been denied, um, again, over the seal hunt, over the Save the Arctic campaign, that kind of thing. But there's never been much support in the Arctic Council to include Greenpeace. Um, but most people really respect the work of the WDF, and they've been quite constructive. Any questions on that before I move on? I'm sure there will be questions on that. I, I'm sure they just don't want to disrupt no it. No. Right, right. Uh, so, so, you know, those are kind of the main players, but underneath that, I consider underneath that, there are the working groups. And there are currently six working groups. Um, so I've listed them there. Um, as you can see, primarily an environmental kind of slant. So Arctic monitoring assessment, flora and fauna, uh, emergency prevention, preparedness and response, uh, I guess is more human oriented, uh, but also, you know, it's about oil spills, for example, so it's a heavy environmental, it's about human activity, but a heavy environmental aspect to that. Uh, protection of the Arctic marine environment, they work closely on some things together. So those were original working groups, those top four, in the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy of 1991. Uh, and I'll talk about the history in a minute, but it's just interesting, and I don't think not all people know, that the Sustainable Development Working Group was added after, and after the Arctic Council was founded. And again, that was Canada pushing to have more of a sustainable development aspect than what the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy had had. 
uh, and wanting to have this new working group to work on uh, sustainable development issues. So that was, they finally took them two years to get the terms of reference worked out for that one. So it was established in 98. And the Arctic Contaminants Action Program came much quite a bit later in 2006. And it had been a, a plan, I think it was the Arctic Contaminants Arctic Plan or Arctic Council something plan. And, and they decided to turn that plan into its own working group, into its own program. Uh, so it kind of went from ad hoc to a permanent working group in 2006. Uh, the working groups are, are quite autonomous, actually, um, because they, are, they precede the Arctic Council. Um, and depending on, you know, depending on the country, um, they are organized. They have a different legal structure, a different legal character, reporting, um, the way that they're funded. Um, the way that they're run, all these things are very different. So we often think of the working groups as quite homogenous and as, as really falling under the Arctic Council. Uh, but in fact, some of them are, are legally uh, separate, legally autonomous. Uh, and of course, they have extremely close relationships with the Arctic Council. But there is no, there's no ability for the senior Arctic official chair really to, you know, to tell them what to do or, you know, it, it, it's more like they present the work to the Arctic Council, the Arctic Council thanks them for it. Um, there's a, there's a, a much, a much, you know, it, it's, it's not maybe a subsidiary relationship that I identified before in practice when you look closely at it legally, it's not so much that way. And the, and the funding varies tremendously. Uh, AMAP, I think, is by far the best funded. Norwegians pay for most of it, and this runs on about a $2 million budget, whereas I think ACAP, um, you know, might have, you know, a $150,000 or $200,000 budget. So vastly different um, kinds of budgets and, and organization. They all have a rotating chair, uh, so much like the Arctic Council itself has a rotating chair, different chairs from different uh, countries will chair them. And some of the countries have taken, uh, you know, a special, um, you know, I think Canada has often supported the SCWG, Norway has supported AMAP, Iceland has often supported CAF, uh, and that kind of thing. So different countries have kind of adopted some of the working groups. Um, Who is on the working groups? A lot of times it's government experts, so people working in the relevant bureaucracies or the relevant ministries in the eight Arctic states, alongside some other scientists or researchers. Uh, and also indigenous representatives. Not every permanent participant has, a, has a, you know, their own representative for each working group. And in fact, for, for some of the smaller ones, their head of delegation is often also the person who goes to the working groups. And so you can imagine um, going to the Arctic Council meetings and then going to six of the working group meetings, um, just logistically and, and finance wise and, and human resource wise, it's not possible. So a lot of the PPs, they prioritize the Sustainable Development Working Group. Um, some of them might prioritize some of the other working groups, uh, but uh, most of them don't go to all the working group meetings every time. They just don't have the human resources to do that. And this is the, the really the obvious and the best level for observers to participate uh, where they have expertise, where they have funding, where there's complementary work, it really makes sense. You know, this is the work. This is the work of the Arctic Council, and this is where observers can actually participate. Um, some of the things that the working groups have come up with, and and the working groups are opaque, if you ask me. Um, it's hard to know. I think it's hard for anybody to know, even the SAO chair, to know really, uh, you know, what they're doing all the time, or, or what the work is, or who does the work, or who funds them. Um, uh, but the things. But they do lots of, you know, really high quality scientific work, but it's not always easy things to communicate, uh, you know, to someone who's a layman in their particular area. So they do a lot of work, I think, in this last ministerial, there was, you know, 30 deliverables amongst the working groups, um, but it's not, not easily communicated kind of work. It's very technical. Uh, but the notable works that, you know, have kind of captured the attention of Arctic watchers was the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment in 2004. And that was kind of really a turning point for the Arctic Council itself, um, where, you know, the climate change was not abstract anymore. It was, it was happening. It wasn't a theory. Uh, and, and very comprehensive and, and very uh, robust uh, scientific report. The Arctic Human Development Reports, the first one was in 2004, and I think the second one was uh, two years ago, I think. And the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment from 2009. And uh, again, another very comprehensive, high-quality report 
uh, that really led to um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of things that we see now, like the IMO um, shipping guidelines and those kinds of things. So it really had a very practical policy application, the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment. So a little bit of the history of the Arctic Council. Oh, it's already 10.30. <laughs> I've got to go a lot faster now. Um, uh, just to, you know, how did it come about? Again, I mentioned the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1987. Gorbachev, in a famous speech in Murmansk, uh, talked about you know having uh, the Arctic as a zone of peace and it's kind of perestroika and glasnost, um, and, and and trying to you know try to position the relationship differently and saying the Arctic in particular is an area where we have lots in common and should be a zone of peace and kind of alluded to you know the from some of the some of the organization and some of the cooperation for indigenous people, for scientists, and for the states, and then the Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, um, two years later, he said yes, we should have a Council of Arctic States when he was in Leningrad, and also so the, the Canadians and the Finns really jumped on Gorbachev's opening more than anybody else. Um, the Finns obviously have a very long border uh, with Russia. The, a lot of the environmental um, kind of uh, fallout from the Soviet Union was affecting them. So they were very keen to start the environmental, Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy in 91, really a Finnish initiative. And even though that got started and everyone liked it, um, Canada kept pushing in the meantime to have an Arctic Council. So something a bit more robust than the AEPS. And of course the Finns and the Nordics were, you know, but wondering what, you know, was, what's wrong with the AEPS? Why do we always need more? And the United States was wary uh, at the time in the 90s of all this proliferation of international organizations that were often cumbersome and big and really restricted what they could do, not that they were kind of the sole superpower. They weren't interested in middle powers kind of constricting them uh, with treaties and forums. Um, and, and Russia was, a, a spar you know, maybe there's a different Russian history of it in, in the Russian language, but all the histories I've read in the English language don't show a very strong role for Russia after um, Gorbachev's speech. Other than the, that the diplomats were very talented, but not so much in affecting what would be discussed or not. Um, so these were kind of the questions in the, in the mid-90s. You know, how are Indigenous peoples going to participate in an intergovernmental forum? Um, are you going to give them a veto? Who represents them? That kind of thing. How are they funded? What are we going to do together about sustainable development? It was very unclear. Um, would the Arctic Council take over the APS or would the APS become the Arctic Council? There were some questions around that. Uh, but anyways, the, it, they overcame all those questions, and in 1996, um, you know, there was a few times where it looked like the idea might just die, uh, that there just might not be an Arctic Council. But finally, I think it was you know, some personal negotiations that um, John Cretan convinced Bill Clinton to do this, and, they, and the Americans watered it down quite a bit institutionally into something that they, were, uh, they could accept. And one thing from a Canadian perspective, I know some of you are Canadians, it is interesting that this was first a conservative initiative under Mulroney, but then the Liberals under Craig Chen, um, you know, totally adopted it and, and totally supported it. So very much a bipartisan kind of issue in Canada. So the milestones, obviously established in 96 and 98, you had the first ministerial and sustainable development working group gets terms of reference. Uh, the 2004 Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, like I discussed, it wasn't until 2009 that there was some kind of central secretariat. The chair had always just assumed all those duties. But then it was getting, a, you know, a, to be a bigger organization with more demands on it, more activities. So the Norwegians established a temporary secretariat in 2009 in Tromso, and the Arctic Council decided to make this permanent in 2013. And that's given it, you know, a bit more uh, heft organizationally. Uh, management and administration wise. In 2008, China applies for observership, and I, I say that because you know that was kind of that was kind of the sign where where the rest of the world, not just the Arctic states, but where the rest of the world kind of noticed the Arctic and noticed the Arctic Council. And it's kind of you know it had tension between is it a regional organization to is it a global organization uh, focused on the Arctic ever since? What is the role for non-Arctic members? And it all kind of started in 2008. And then, even though it is not, it is a forum itself, it has, starting in 2011, negotiated three, uh, you know, legally binding agreements under its auspices, is what we say. So they're not Arctic Council agreements per se, because the Arctic Council has no legal authority to, to negotiate that or, or to make states agree to it, but the state, the eight Arctic states negotiated under its auspices. So we have one on search and rescue, 
one on marine oil pollution preparedness and response, and then the latest one just in May on international Arctic scientific cooperation. What are the key challenges of the Arctic Council? Um, a lack of predictable and adequate funding. Um, because it is a forum, it's very much ad hoc. Um, the, I think the Secretariat probably in total uh, gets a, it gets about a million dollars from each, um, let me think, doing the math. Not that much. A couple hundred thousand. And then um, Norway provides the bulk of the money. I think overall its budget is, is less than five million. And, 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 and a, lot of the, a lot of its funding, or I, would, I guess you could call it, is in kind that different government ministries and government departments, you know, do the work of the working group or contribute members to, you know, particular initiatives. Uh, but it's impossible to track that kind of funding um, because, you know, it's a portion of somebody's time and, uh, you know, how much time do we devote to it? What's Arctic Council business versus Arctic, um, you know, geopolitical business or, you know, Department of Environment responsibilities or Coast Guard responsibilities versus Arctic Council. So it's impossible to track all that funding. Uh, but the point is, you know, it's, it's if, if you tried to, and the meetings and the travel and all that, you might, you might come up to about $20 million um, that, that runs the Arctic Council, which isn't that much money when you think about, you know, the you know, infrastructure in the Arctic Council or, or governance in, or in the Arctic, sorry, governance in the Arctic. Um, $20 million isn't a lot to run, and, and so much of it is just travel. So there's not a lot. If people wanted to do more, for example, on climate change or shipping, um, then it will need more uh, predictable funding. How do you meaningfully represent Indigenous peoples? And, and yes, it has the six permanent participants. There is some question as to how, how well do the permanent participants represent all Indigenous peoples as well. There are some of them are very small organizations running on one or two hundred thousand dollars with one or two or three staff. How do they consult with, with everyone in their giant, you know, giant regions, expensive to reach regions? How do they communicate the materials? Um, is there translation into indigenous languages so people can learn about it? You know, how much does a kind of, kind of at the local level do people really know about the Arctic Council? The answer is not that much. Um, so how do, you know, the question has always been building, the, how do you build the capacity of the permanent participants so that they, they can meaningfully represent indigenous peoples? And it's very challenging uh, for people to know, you know, to be able to speak English, which is the working language of the Arctic Council, and have, you know, for example, a, a scientific background, you know, at the PhD level, say, uh, for many of the working groups, uh, and also be able to travel, and also be Indigenous, and also have, you know, community connections and Indigenous communities to be able to go consult and meaningfully represent. Those people are very rare, and so that's always been the challenge of, of the human resources, finding the right people. Uh, who are able to represent the permanent participants and all these different things. And then some people say, well, there's six spaces for Indigenous peoples, but 90% of residents of the Arctic are non-Indigenous. Um, and who represents them? Who represents the people of Yakutsk? Uh, for example, uh, Yakutians, they're an ethnic minority. They were colonized by the Russians. Um, that they are not considered Indigenous under Russian law, and they're not part of Rapon because there's too many of them. Um, so even though in other respects they certainly seem indigenous from, for example, a Canadian definition, uh, they are not included as indigenous people uh, in Russia and therefore not in, in the Arctic Council. Same with, you know, what about the people of Alaska or Lapland uh, or Northern Iceland um, or Greenland for that matter. So the Inuit Circumpolar Council gets a seat at the table, but not Greenland, which is 85% uh, Inuit, and they're democratically uh, elected and have much more capacity to participate. Uh, so there's all those kinds of questions. Who, you know, who and how are people represented? How do we meaningfully include the observers? The observers um, often asking for more robust roles. And, and the Arctic Council states trying to figure out, you know, certainly they want their support, their scientific contributions, funding, uh, but without compromising decision-making abilities. The east-west dynamics, obviously, with Russia, um, is, Russia is often on a different page with the Western countries uh, on many on many issues, uh, but it hasn't you know so it, there's a dynamic for sure, uh, and, and there's a, you know depending on who's elected into particular countries, 
that even though it works well at that bureaucratic level or the diplomatic level, there's always a fear that some country is going to come in and say, oh no, we're not going to participate with Russia in the Arctic Council or we're going to boycott these meetings and that kind of a thing, even though at the Arctic Council level it works very well. Uh, continuity in its work because it has two-year chairmanships. How, you know, how do you get anything done in two years or how do you make sure that, you know, priorities are followed um, and the work is, is uh, held accountable over the course of more than two years. So medium and long-term planning. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of reports, but not a lot of action all the time, and no ability of the Arctic Council to hold states accountable for what they do say that they're going to do. Uh, lots of discussion on whether it can move from a policy shaping to a policy making institution. I mentioned before it's institutionally weak based on the Ottawa Declaration. Um, and sometimes there's tension between environmental protection, in which many people see as a preservation function to preserve the Arctic, and then it can be competing with, you know, the development side. Um, that people need jobs, people need to get out of poverty, people need to be self-determining, and this all takes, uh, you know, probably resource development or shipping um, or other kinds of things that, that have uh, a footprint on the environment. So there's always this dynamic, and this is maybe best represented when the Arctic Economic Council was established in 2015, a Canadian initiative, but um, you know, the Americans were quite opposed to it. They watered a lot of it down. Um, there, was, there was this sense, and that was under the Obama administration, but there was this sense that you know, business in the Arctic is, is exploitative, um, even though, you know, people, again, people need to have jobs and people live there. And so this feeling that for some people in the Arctic that people think that they live in a park and everything's to be preserved and they're to be kept in this kind of um, subsistence lifestyle and others saying, you know, how, how, how threatened uh, the Arctic is and that collectively we need to do something about it. Heather, I, I hate to interrupt. Um, I just wanted to say if, if you can close the presentation soon because we do have quite a few questions in the lineup. And I would then uh, go to the question session, and um, obviously I would have questions myself too. But All I don't right, want to. So people, can, yeah, yeah. people can read through this one slide, just some of the key misperceptions. Yeah. It doesn't govern all these things. And this is my last slide, anyways. Um, I really do think that the Arctic Council deserves a Nobel Peace Prize um, because it really is a model. I just want to leave this with, with everyone that it is a model for East-West cooperation. And I was at the Fairbanks Ministerial and it's a shock to me, first of all, that the Americans agreed to put the Paris Climate Accord in the Declaration, which is a small thing, it's symbolic. But it just goes to show that the, the normal rules of, of geopolitics and real politics don't apply to the Arctic Council. That when they're together, you know, all the foreign ministers are happy, uh, and the Russians are included like everyone else, and the indigenous um, heads of delegation are included just like everyone else. Uh, it, it's really just become its own thing. It's really resilient to outside uh, tensions. It does all the right things, you know, that we think, you know, that we think people should do. Environmental protection, a precautionary approach, science, evidence-based decision-making, inclusivity, all those things. So. I just wanted to leave you off with this idea that, in, in my opinion anyways, and I think there's a lot of objective evidence to support it, it really is a unique uh, and, and I think special kind of regional organization uh, in the world. So I'll end it there, Max. Thank you very much. For no, no, and it's, it's not the end because we do have a few questions uh, directed at you and I want to open the microphone for Brittany first. Uh, if you if you want to ask your question yourself, your first question, you have two questions, but if you want to go with your first question first, you can go ahead sure, now. Thanks. Um, so I was just wondering if you think that the lack of transparency or opacity in the work group um, contributes to a limited interaction across those work groups, which then kind of stymies the ability to do more integrative work. Um, to really kind of meaningfully address some of the big issues like sustainable development. Yeah, and, and that's been a, people have discussed that. I know that's an issue of discussion of how the working groups have, are in many ways silos. And we all, in, in all of our organizations and institutions, we all operate in silos to some extent. And there's obviously lots of room for overlap between many of those working groups. And it might, and, and you know, 
but it's very difficult, like I say, because they have different legal structures, different organizational structures, different funding, even, you know, the, the timing of the funding that they get. It makes it hard always to work across those groups. One thing that they've done, I think, here to Council to address that is develop these task forces. So where they choose a particular issue that's, you know, thematic um, and usually ad hoc to address a, a particular issue in, in a two or four year time span. And so I, that's been, you know, because of the, the path dependence, I think, on the way that the working groups work and everyone recognizes there's some silos and trying to break that down. But in the meantime, the task forces are a, a quicker, more efficient way to address some of those thematic problems. Okay, very good. Uh, Bern, I don't know if you are in a position where you can ask your question yourself. I'll unmute you, otherwise I can read your question as well. You think you can ask it? Okay, good. good. Yeah, so um, I was curious if you could comment a bit on the mandate of the Arctic Council. Um, one of my interests has long been climate change. I, my original training was in atmospheric science, so I follow the weather and climate like a science geek. Um, and as you probably know, there was a report a few years ago about the national security implications of climate change. Mm -hmm. And then just this morning, there was a fascinating article on the New York Times website about the thawing of the permafrost in Alaska and the implications of that for future warming of the climate system. So as we continue to witness these changes, I think it's important um, not only that we adopt a precautionary approach, like you were articulating in the one slide, but that we be proactive. And I'm just curious if you could comment some on any efforts to rethink or revise the mandate of the council in light of current events and future predicted changes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in terms of changing the structure or, you know, the terms of reference for the Arctic Council, I think that'd be so, it would be very difficult and no one even brings it in, brings it up because, you know, you know, it's just opening up a can of worms in a way. Um, but, but the Arctic Council has tried more and more to work on climate change, and that's been a big message um, from a lot of the, the chairs, certainly the Americans and the, and the Finns have prioritized that. So how does it do that, though? It's a regional organization. And as we know, mitigating climate change is, is a global issue. So um, it, it certainly monitors and, and documents climate changes in the Arctic, and it had shared that to the IPCC. And it hopes to, you know, contribute to the, the Paris Accord, and, and for example, with that information. But the Arctic states, you know, probably at a mitigation level, that's either at a national level, things that they do, impose their own carbon taxes, that kind of thing, where they have legislative powers to do things, uh, or at a global level to contribute to something like the Paris Accord, where we all try to mitigate our, 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 our emissions. What, so what is, what is the right thing? What is, where is the space at the Arctic Council level to contribute to, to addressing climate change? And what they have done is black carbon. Um, so you probably know better than me if you're a science nerd um, that black carbon is a short term, what is the short, short term climate pollutant uh, that in the short term it has a, a lot more impact on melting. I mean, the, black, the black carbon sits on the snow, it attracts heat, it attracts melting, that kind of thing. Um, but that's a very, a very a regional issue that the Arctic Council itself can address. For example, in um, you know uh, getting rid of diesel uh, is would be a big one. Diesel and, and most Arctic communities, certainly in North America, do use diesel. Uh, a lot of uh, in Russia, there's a lot of use of diesel, and trying to eliminate that or at least mitigate uh, you know the impacts of that and and burning fire and that kind of thing. So what the Arctic Council has done at a regional level to address climate change. Uh, proactively and in practical terms is its work on black carbon. Uh, other than that, I think it, it you know advocates or tries to advocate at a global level for mitigation, um, but but that's you know I like I said that's a global level kind of issue. Yeah, and just as a, a kind of a follow up comment with a question embedded in it, um, I, I I would be curious to learn too if the council has any form policy statement about geoengineering because there are some thoughts out there that we might need to geoengineer our way out of whatever we might be creating decades hence with the climate system and like I remember when you talk about black, black carbon it brings to mind I remember decades ago I think the US military had talked about like 
deliberately trying to melt the Arctic by, you know, dispersing dark materials that would absorb more solar radiation. And then, well, maybe we could try the opposite and disperse a lot of white reflective materials and try to, you know, mitigate what's happening. So anyway, as a, as a topic offline, I'd be curious to learn more if the, if the yeah. council has I haven't heard of anything around geoengineering. The way it would probably happen, and I expect at some point it would, is that one of the working groups would have a project amongst, you know, their half a dozen or a dozen projects looking at the feasibility of something like that, maybe a, a particular tool or method. Um, uh, it, also, some of these things are, again, national level. So if it was going to take place in Russian waters, it would be a Russian national decision, not an Arctic Council decision. Uh, so it may, if, it, if it's something you know that had to be done in international waters, then the Arctic Council might make a declaration. Although it's not the international waters and at North around the North Pole aren't Arctic Council waters either. Um, but uh, it, it probably would, I would expect it, it would take the place of a, a working group project looking at the feasibility of some of those uh, opportunities. Well, that's a good lead into the next question, and I'll ask it on behalf of David. Um, I hope I render this correctly, otherwise you just send a follow-up question. It's about the role of traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples in, in these working groups, in, this, uh, in the science process, in the scientific process of the working groups. And you mentioned this in your presentation, you mentioned that you're looking, or they're looking basically for indigenous representatives who have Western knowledge, who have a PhD, who can basically be this traditional scientist, but in how far is this, um, yeah, traditional knowledge or um, uh, also represented there, and what role can it play, and uh, is it accepted as a as a valid source of information? Yeah, and I would say that the Arctic Council is is probably. The, the best place, you know, that does, re that really does accept it and has come the furthest in accepting the value of it and then it's part of its culture and its norms and values now. And I was part of a, uh, you know, a, just a small consulting project looking at the permanent participants trying to, you know, the government of Canada trying to find ways to build their capacity and I interviewed all the PPs and I was expecting, and I'm in, in southern Canada where there's, you know, still a lot of tension in, in, in many respects. Uh, and problems between, you know, the colonial state Canada and First Nations. And I was expecting a lot more negativity. And, you know, I was, in some of my questions, I had to say when I look back, I was assuming that there would be this tension and these problems. But when I talked to the PPs, it was all, you know, it was, there was practical and logistical problems. But there was, there was in a sense that their views weren't valued, that they weren't included, that they didn't have influence. Uh, and those kinds of things. So that was, that was very mind-blowing in, in a sense to me that the Arctic Council had already by, you know, two years ago gone to a point where really there's a lot of integration and inclusion and really we're down to practical challenges. And, you know, in, back in 1996, there certainly would have been a challenge with accepting traditional knowledge and people thinking it's, it's token or it's politically correct and not everyone buying into it. And I would say probably in the last five to ten years, um, the, you know, people, people appreciate it and, and recognize it. And it doesn't mean it's easy. And if, you know, if, if you're doing a project and you want, you know, a response in two years when the next ministerial comes, which is often the timeline, that's not always enough time to go in and consult and make relationships with communities. Uh, if any of you do research with Indigenous communities, you already know that two years is probably not enough time, you know, to get from start to completion. And so how do you, so one thing people have said is that there's a lot of Indigenous, there's, there's pretty good Indigenous representation but it's not the same as having traditional knowledge. And, and you can have you know, your 30-year-old your professional who has a master's or a PhD degree who is indigenous participating, but that's different from having the knowledge keeper, having an elder uh, be involved and participate and go to you know, a meeting every four months in a different Arctic country and share their findings and, and it all. Um, so, so the feeling now is that when projects get started, they have to be developed with the, with the process for including traditional knowledge in mind. But of course, that is tricky, that's hard to do, and it's time consuming and can be expensive. Um, so there's certainly a desire. I think there's a lot of pol political will to do it, but actually doing it in practice is, 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 is very difficult. Great. 
Thank you. And we do have another question related to the working groups, and I'll open the microphone again for Brittany. It's your second question. If you want to ask it yourself, please go ahead now. Sure. Um, so I was wondering if the working groups, um, if there's like any particular working groups that have really good observer participation, and if you think that um, the working groups serve as an opportunity for participation to be increased that's kind of underutilized right now, especially by non-Arctic states. Um, if any one of you has, has an idea, I'd be happy to hear it. I, I don't know that much about the working groups except for the Sustainable Development Working Group because that's just my, I'm not, I'm not a natural scientist, I'm a social scientist. I know that PAME, um, because it has its big budget, and has pretty straightforward goals um, is better suited to those kind of things. The Sustainable Development Working Group, because uh, you know, because it is more local uh, challenges in nature, I guess, is a harder one for non-Arctic states to contribute to or to really understand kind of the issues. And that's one where the where the PPs would have more involvement. Um, but I would have a look at what where you know um, what the WWF WWF has been involved in, where they've been involved in. Um, in, in the other respects, the working groups do Arctic science, but lots of people do Arctic science. So it's not the end all and be all of Arctic science either. So, you know, what, what you know, Poland or Japan, for example, very involved in the Arctic, uh, in IAS, the Arctic, International Arctic Science Council, and, and might be involved in many other Arctic science kinds of things, and, and maybe it gets fed through the Arctic Council. Maybe it doesn't get through, fed through the Arctic Council, because not all Arctic decision-making goes through there either. Maybe it goes through different ministries. Uh, so so I, I can't, I mean, that's not a very good answer for that, except for that I, sometimes you have to think broader than just the Arctic Council and just the working groups that, you know, those other places that, that these observer states can and do Arctic science. Um, and, and not necessarily has to filter through the Arctic Council, and mostly doesn't. Good. Um, Brittany, was that a semi-answer to your question? <laughs> that was my best answer. I wish I knew. If anyone knows any more about the working groups and can, can contribute, that would be great. Yeah, okay, great. I, so I participated in the AMAP meeting that was in D.C. Um, to kind of get a flavor of um, the breadth of work that's going on. And so I was wondering about the role of these working groups in sort of allaying um, one of the critiques of non-Arctic states and their level of participation. And it's like if they're underutilizing this opportunity, that's a more direct way that they could demonstrate, you know, leadership and investment in, um, in the Arctic to potentially have a bigger voice um, and maybe greater representation than they currently feel like they have. Yeah, and I agree. And one other problem with, you know, that one of the challenges is that the Arctic Council's agenda is becoming so full. And, you know, with, with each working group having, you know, you know, 10 or 12 projects going at once, the Arctic Council having its full agenda. Um, and there isn't a lot, of de a lot of demand or a lot of hunger for more projects. And, and a project to be approved has to go through either the eight Arctic states or the PPs. And I've heard some people say if the observer countries were, were smart, they'd start partnering with the PPs. Um, because, you know, the, the eight Arctic states have their own agendas, have their own priorities. They don't really care what China, Japan, or Switzerland wants to bring to the Arctic Council agenda. They have their own ideas. But if they could work with the PPs on something that the PPs are interested in, they could bring funding to that and resources to that. That would probably be the, you know, the most efficient way to get a project that's in their particular interest approved at the Arctic Council level. Okay. Great. Um, let's go to the last question for you, Heather. And of course, Heather, you're more than welcome to stay on as long as you would like and maybe engage in the next uh, semi-session as well. But uh, time is uh, running out fast here. And I have uh, the pleasure to read the last question again. So it's coming from Lisa Corvino and she asked me to read her question. Do you think that in the future there will be some changes in the Ottawa Declaration articles considering the importance of the great ecologic changes the Arctic region is facing today? I imagine that includes climate change uh, as a big topic. And then there's a second part to the question. 
do you believe the forum structure will remain an effective means of balance of power in the future? And with that, I would almost, I'm tempted to add now here, where do you see there, do you see new member states, new um, permanent participants coming on board, or do you think this is something that's currently not uh, realistic? But let's go first to, is there a need for changing the Ottawa Declaration articles, or is there a perceived need for that? There is a perceived need for sure, but I guess it's a cost-benefit analysis to spend two years or four years trying to think of ways that they can all agree, now that it's baked in, you know, there's some path dependence on changing the declaration. But if you look at the declaration, it, it's almost, it, one, of the, one of the beauties, you know, it's weak on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's vague enough that, that the count states, if they want to, can work quite, you know, can work within it, can work within its parameters to do more things. So like I say, the task forces and the agreements, the three agreements that were negotiated under its auspices are good examples of that. The other thing is that the Arctic states are doing things outside the Arctic Council when they want to or when they need to. And so it's, the Arctic Council isn't the only game in town. So for example, with fisheries, they are currently working the Arctic states, not through the Arctic Council, but the Arctic states have already developed a precautionary you know, declaration that they won't fish in the Central Arctic Ocean until there is um, some kind of um, you know, uh, uh, agreement around it. And now, they, and now that's expanded, that was the Arctic Five, and now it's expanded to include Iceland and you know, China, Japan, Korea, who are most likely to be fishing in those waters when, when the fish stocks move, when it becomes accessible. Working now in a precautionary way to develop an international Arctic fishing agreement. Uh, and the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, for example, where it wouldn't really fit under the Arctic Council, but the Arctic states, and it's, it's an eight state initiative, it's, pract it's practically the Arctic Council, but where, where they created a separate institution with separate terms of reference and kind of a, a separate organization that's very complementary. There's some, you know, reporting and, and communication. So, and also to develop these agreements, which even though the Arctic Council isn't a treaty organization, they can still adopt agreements, eight party agreements that addresses, you know, maybe, maybe you know, climate change or, or shipping or that kind of thing. On shipping, they use the International Maritime Organization, which is a more obvious, which is a treaty organization, and is more suited, has more capacity, it has more expertise on regulating shipping. Um, so I, I think the, the, the Arctic states do things that are not always within the Arctic Council, and that's how they're getting around the limitations of the Arctic Council. And I like it, I think it's worked out well, even though I don't think it was on purpose. The Arctic Council has remained a place where where, you know, the, where the norms get developed, where the values get developed, where people can always discuss and talk. Um, and, and, and that's very, this turned out to be very important and very good. And even though it doesn't maybe have as much action as, you know, a stronger tooth kind of forum would, um, it's really, it's the platform on which everything else can, can be developed. So in, in some senses, when I think, yeah, changes, you know, obviously you might have done things differently. Uh, but now that we are where we are, um, there would be a lot of costs, I think, also to having changes that might not be worth the benefit. And I'll thank you, Max, very much for having me, and I will stay on and look forward to the next presenter. So thanks, everybody. Well, I want to thank you, Heather, and I think it's a very good point to, to mention. I mean, you said that multiple times. Yes, there's, a, you know, you can always do more, you can add more, but there's time constraints and there's financial constraints and they want to be realistic and rather do something that is feasible than, than aiming for the absolute best, the maximum, and then not getting this. This is an interesting point because sometimes coming from a more academic perspective, of course, the focus is more on what's the optimal solution, but that's not always the politically realistic setting. So thank yeah. you very much, and I think um, great f that you can stay on a little bit longer and um, I will now hand over to our next uh, presenter of today, um, Jocelyn. Hi Jocelyn, thank you for being here today. Uh, Jocelyn Jo Strack, I just introduce you very quickly. It's actually a very good fit because we talked a lot about the role of indigenous people and uh, 
the representation of indigenous people. And uh, that's kind of your uh, focus topic, both for your presentation, but also your research. And of course, um, maybe I oversimplify and you can correct me uh, once I stop talking. You're a member of the Champagne and Aishihik First Nation in the Yukon Territory of Northwestern Canada. And you are uh, currently pursuing a PhD at the University of Saskatchewan and your focus is on settlement land use planning uh, with, with your First Nation. So this is fittingly also the topic for today uh, for your presentation, Indigenous Land Use Planning. I think it's great to have you here. Uh, I'm very, very interested to hear more about your, um, I assume that it's also including very practical experiences, personal experiences, but also academic aspects. So it's a great mix. And I'm really sorry we squeezed already five minutes out of your time slot. So I'm gonna be quiet now and hand over to you. Welcome. All right, thank you. And uh, my sound is okay? It sounds good? Okay. Yes. Absolutely. You just have to go, uh, when you go in the presentation, you still have to go into the presentation mode. Then we All see right. the process. Thank you. We're good there. So thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you, Heather, for your presentation. I, I very much enjoyed it. And it was interesting and always good to hear um, evolving perspectives of what the Arctic Council is up to. And uh, definitely appropriate as I come into my presentation here and, and who I am and, and where I'm from. So of course I had a lot of interest in uh, some of the discussion around uh, the permanent participants and the use of traditional knowledge and I guess that's a lot of where I'm coming from now. I, I am uh, one of the indigenous PhDs that you discussed. Uh, my master's is in uh, biochemistry and microbiology and uh, during that time, I started to feel really frustrated with the narrowness of my science and the limitation in the box that I felt when it came to understanding my home and my land. I could describe all that there was about the trees or microbiology in a lake. I could describe about this much of what the entire environment actually was. Yet with the teachings from my home and my upbringing, I understand and I know that the environment is comprehensive and full and to only look at a micro and think that I know something about it to me was just folly and frustrating. Um, so as I went in to pursue a PhD, actually I, actually I, I began consulting. So um, after my PhD and I work now as I, can, I have my own consulting company, Subarctic Research and Strategy. And I started working with my nation and I found a good pot of money to complete settlement land planning for our nation. And I'll get a little bit more into what that entails, but essentially this project was a really good opportunity as I was writing up the work plan. I was like, well, it's a three-year project that begins with some research and background information and then I complete a report and I put it through. I was like, that kind of sounds like a PhD. <laughs> so I called up some folks at the University of Saskatchewan and um, decided to pursue academic work in conjunction with my professional work. Land use planning is an interesting question uh, when it comes to how we make decisions about the land and how we value the land. Traditional knowledge is not talking to people and trying to decide what kind of quantifiable or even qualifiable knowledge they can provide you with. It's an adjustment and an understanding of how we value and how we live on the land with our families and as a lifestyle. Family is incredibly important to my people. and. Um, when we view the land, we view future, the future of our children. When we view the land, we view a, a special relationship, something that you can't quantify, you can't put into numbers. 
So as we move forward in land planning, we're doing it at the beginning here with without numbers. I've, in my science, I feel like I spent so much time learning statistics and learning how to put numbers, a theoretical system, to make decisions and, and make an understanding about something, which obviously is a very good proven method, and I, I'm strongly trained in it, but it doesn't bring heart. It doesn't bring family. It doesn't bring longevity. It gives you a snapshot of what's happening. And then you try and make long-term decisions about that. So I'll get a little bit more into, you know, kind of where we're coming from, from land planning. But I'll show you this here, this beginning slide. This is Mount Decoli, um on the side here. It's on the very end of a very long range of mountains that overlook Haines Junction, um, one of my homes in the Yukon. Mount Decoli is a very popular mountain for uh, recreation, mountain climbers. It has strong mineral potential. Um, it resides within Kluwani National Park and is the beginning of the range of some of the biggest mountains in Canada. It is a weather mountain for my people. Because it's this last mountain on this huge range, the, our grandmas used to look at it and they could tell what the weather would be as it came around. This mountain that's the size that the weather would come from. And there's a big lake at the bottom of that valley there that would help sort of impact the weather, I guess. That mountain has some interesting lore about it in terms of some of the creatures. My people believe in Sasquatch. Sometimes they still even go running around for, there'll be a big Sasquatch hunt and everybody will jump in their cars and their ATVs and go out looking. It's kind of funny. Um, but the, the belief is real. Truth is real. You have to believe to make these decisions. And some of that belief is entailed. We believe in numbers today, right? So not to call it, I was home to a few Sasquatch too. But uh, just to tell you a little bit more. Oh, come on, slide. There we go. So this is where I'm from. I'm from the Yukon Territory. Here's a nice uh, numerical map for you. Um, you can see that it's very mountainous in the northwest corner of Canada. Uh, it's sort of like a frontier place that has um, lots of history in terms of the gold rush. There was a, a gold rush up in Dawson City in the 1900s. And uh, that was kind of the main sort of influx of people to, to the Yukon. We border Alaska, and uh, we have part of the Arctic Ocean, and then we have British Columbia to the south and Northwest Territories the east. It's, it's very beautiful at home. It, uh, I didn't even realize it growing up. I totally took it for granted and I couldn't wait to leave. So I went to university partly as an out <laughs> to, to Victoria in BC, a place where it didn't snow. And um, it, I was forced to come back after, about, after university because <laughs> I was poor. And I'll never forget the moment where I looked up at the mountains one day during the summer, and I was like, wow, it's kind of nice here, hey? Like, <laughs> um, and I just kind of had this moment where I realized how special my home was. You can usually take things for granted. For my graduating class of, I think there's 66 of us, 80% of us left. And of that 80%, I'd say 90% of us all came home. It's just beautiful here. It's very special. Um, it offers so much more than such a, it's just such a home where you can um, really explore, you can be grounded, um, and there's something good for your soul about looking at such beauty every day. This is my family. Um, so I'm a member of the Champagne and Ajax First Station. I'll go back here. We're down in the bottom corner and see the St. Elias Mountains there. I would say the right angle, the right angle of the triangle, that's where we kind of reside. In the biggest mountains, we are a big mountain and big lake people. This photo was taken in 2008 at the Elder Senate that we had, and I was looking through this picture yesterday, and many of these faces are no longer with us, and it, I like this picture. It's, it's nice to see their faces again, and of uh, my grandmas and grandpas. Our, our elders and family is very important. 
traditionally, um, the, the parents used to go out and work and, uh, you know, go hunting and work the hives, make clothing and be very busy. And the elders would, grandmas would take care of the children. And all of our elders always have such, like, fond memories of their children, or of their grandparents, sorry. And they spend a lot of time just teaching and, and being with them. And the family unit and the offer of community that my family provides me and my family, my small, my baby and my husband and I, um, is so special. You know, I go to a gathering with four or 500 people, and my baby, she just, like, when she was just a little tyke, she would just, like, go off into the masses. And I'd be like, where is baby? I'd be like, I don't know. She's, you know, somebody's got her. And everybody's just getting passed around and getting loved up. And even still, they go run around, and everybody just takes care of each other's kids. Everybody disciplines each other's kids, you know. And it used to be a thing where if uh, your child or your family member or your clan member, we have wolf and crow clan, you see in our logo here, crow is on the left. I don't know if it's your left, but <laughs> wolf is on the right. I'm a member of the wolf clan. And if one of my wolf clan family members would behave poorly, another wolf clan family member would come talk to me to talk to them. And I would never accost or be able to accost a, a crow clan member. I would have to talk to somebody else who would talk to their brother or their sister to say something to them. We had a lot of uh, behind the scenes assertions. So there wasn't a lot of like public scrutiny it was a little bit in the quiet, but you would hear about it if you acted in the wrong. It was a completely different way of, of life and a different culture. There was, you know, nuances. You, you didn't jump, jump over things, for example. Like we were just out in the bush last week fishing, where there was no fish. I'll talk about that. But uh, we went to this old, old village that we go visit sometimes that is abandoned now, but it's, it's very interesting to go there I that the power that you feel in some of these old places is, is very real and um, so but when we went there they had an old pit they used to dig out these pits and then they would bury all the food and everything in there and there was a little kid and she was jumping over the pit and I kind of just really quickly was like hey she shouldn't be jumping over that pit because you didn't jump over things it was disrespectful you didn't walk over um, like bear scat on the trail, you walked around it. There's this whole aspect of not showing through your action and your words disrespect to the smallest thing. So even like a bear scat, he put that there. You know, you walk around it, you don't walk over it. Fish, their heads have to be upstream. I think that's the next picture here. Because that's the way that they were heading. So back in the day, the land used to really de depict like how we operated. We, we were in tune, we lived with the land, we lived in the harmony and the, the, the wave of the land. We would adjust. If fire came, we'd bury our stuff and we would keep moving and then we would rebuild. We used to burn on purpose. And uh, with the, there's been some major fires in British Columbia this year and I've seen in the news there was a thing about how First Nations people used to, to burn and manage the land in that way. And there was discussion that maybe that's a practice we should uptake again. And that was because of an understanding of the need for the land to regenerate. So we walk into a forest now and we will say something like, this forest needs to burn. It's overgrown. Even fire, we would never, in our language, um, you would never, it, it was kind of interesting. We, we didn't have a lot of nouns. We had a lot of verbs. So, uh, Things weren't objectified the way the same way that they are in English. Like we would never say the fire, put some wood on the fire. You would hear the fire crack and you would say, Oh fire, you're hungry. Let me feed you. Everything was alive. Like Tunai is eagle, which means water watcher. So you'd say, Dante Tunai, thank you for watching the water. Gonna teach. It was such a different way to view the land. The trees were our ancestors. So when you walk through the forest, you would feel and you would know 
that all of your grandmas and your grandpas and your your souls of before were there harboring and watching your steps as you walk through the forest. You have a little big different view of how or when or why to chop down a tree if you thought it was your ancestor. So when they used a tree, they would give great thanks. And there maybe they, the plankets of the coast, they would never chop down a tree. They would uh, use parts of trees so they would still live. So, and then there's change, right? So for us, one of the biggest changes, there was the, the gold rush in the 1900s and the introduction of the market commodity commodity market with uh, the fur trade that happened in the 1850s, 1900s. But the biggest change for us was uh, the construction of the Alaska Highway in 1942 and 43, which was put in in two years from Dawson Creek to Fairbanks, Alaska. It's a long ways for a year and a half and a lot of winter. Um, with the Alaska Highway came our relocation from the bush, uh, our move into stagnant or cemented homes, and uh, the move of the children to residential school, uh, which resulted in loss of language, loss of family, loss of connection and understanding of the forest, and um, loss of self-esteem. Really, a lot of the children were told that they were no good. So that was my dad's generation. My dad went to residential school. And, um, you know, some came out of there okay, and, and many didn't. Many really struggle with addictions and, and hardship and even just the notion of simply how to love in a healthy way. Because if you're five and school moms raise you telling you that you are dirty um, and you don't get hugs and you're separated from your siblings, your your notion of how to love is, is just not well developed. So thankfully, you know, some of us, we, we were doing very well. We have great leadership. It's just, it's just a quality that seems to be instilled in us in, uh, worldwide. I think we are worldwide um, leaders. We have some of the strongest leaders, and, and I'm very thankful to have be a part of them and, and be trained by them. So in 1973, after all this hardship, uh, a delegation of Yukon leaders led by Elijah Smith went to Ottawa and handed over a document called Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow to Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau at the time. And it outlined a statement of grievances from the Yukon people, First Nations people, and what they wanted to do to reconcile and to better the lives in the future for their children. And uh, even that title, right, Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow is, is so powerful. And what it did is it started a 20-year negotiation of our agreement. And we ended up in 1993 with the Umbrella Final Agreement, which has shaped the political and legislative structure of the Yukon Territory. The Yukon didn't become a territory until the 70s. Our legislative and our um, policy regime was developed through the 80s and 90s. So, and then we devolved from the federal government. The federal government used to manage all of our land up until 2001. And that has now been devolved to the Yukon government under the legislation depicted in the Umbrella Final Agreement, our Yukon First Nations Agreement. So in the territory in the Yukon, we hold a lot of autonomy, um, a lot of self-determination. Each Yukon First Nation has their own self-government. So at the same level under the Constitution as the Yukon Territorial Government, um, we are able to, to enact law that can supersede federal or territorial law. So something like a water law or justice, we are able to hold justice for our own people if we wish. But the Umbrella Final Agreement was written in the spirit of co-management. So they have something called like, the spirit and intent when they talk about the Umbrella Final Agreement. And uh, co-management was so the water is done by co-management boards where there's equal representation of First Nations and government on, on, a, on a water board, on a, the, our environmental and social economic assessment board. Um, there's a lot of boards. So talking about capacity challenges, that's one of them. The other one is land planning. So there's a land planning commission 
and land planning is something that was uh, outlined in the Umbrella Final Agreement. It set out these different areas that you see here in this little map, with the Kulawani region being my region. But to date, we finished the North Yukon Plan, and this is from 1993, right? We finished the North Yukon Plan, and now the Peel Watershed Plan is in the Supreme Court. Uh, because of the dichotomy of argument between development and First Nation um, preservation, I guess. Or, I don't know, I struggle. Is it content? I, so this is where land use becomes challenging. You know, use and, and how we view the land in how they developed the Peel Watershed Plan, it was purely about to develop or not to develop. And that was it. But to me and to my people, there's many, many, many ways to use the land. But it's not all about conservation or extraction. So what can we take out? And But within the Western paradigm of decision making, much is about extraction and input to the commodity market. And that's the model. That's the model. Like, And to me, it, it's so limited about how there are so many more things that you can value out of the bush than just what you can take. It's a very selfish. Um, and greed-inspired uh, method, in my opinion, heavily dependent on numbers um, that of how much you can take. So, oh, this is me and my daddy. <laughs> and I just put this up here because in that in that argument of, of numbers, the commodity market, it's so short-term. Many of these land use plans are only 25 years long, whereas my people plan for generations. And that's a, like a tidbit tad thing that people, oh, seven generations down the road, but it's true. It's, it's so, so, so true. Everything that we do, everything that we've been trained, our, our the whole history of our people is about self longevity and thinking of next generation, sacrifice for generations to come. My daddy sacrificed his life and his hard work and devoted his work for, for me. When they signed the agreement, he he came, but I was 10 years old, and he came running into my room and he gave me his copy of the Umbrella Final Agreement, and he was like, this is for you. And he instilled that in me, um, that devotion to the longevity. So now I have a baby. I think that's the next picture. Yeah, it's me and my baby. And now this is my task. This is my duty. And I hope to instill the same thing in her. That's traditional knowledge, right? That way of life, that devotion, that purpose of why we make decisions and why we do things for the future for our children. And, that, you know, many other, everybody does that, I think. Everybody has this, this feeling and this devotion and the need to safeguard the earth. But, you know, I think about the grandbabies of my grandbabies. That, that's who I want this world for and this life for and this lifestyle, this connection. So land planning is one way to do that. I recognize that I'm already I'm gonna take my extra five minutes. <laughs> um, so this is how our traditional territory and we were very nomadic people. We traveled from north to west and or sorry, north to south and south to west. We used to fish in some places. Uh, we'd travel where the where the animals were essentially. I don't think I'm gonna get a chance to talk about the fish. This is our land after our agreement. And so you can see all the green land is our settlement land. So this is land that we own the surface and the subsurface of and that we are fully titled to. And then the rest is crown land that we co-manage with the Yukon government. And um, part of what the Peel argument was about was how much the Yukon government at one point felt that they had entitlement to plan all of the crown land, it was their responsibility, but you know, the spirit and the intent of the agreements was co-management. <sighs> the way that we plan, just looking back yesterday, Katake, we plan for today, a continue to think about tomorrow. Kata. This is uh, the Dalton cattle drive, it's kind of cool. During the gold rush, uh, this man Dalton, he drove up hundreds of cattle into the Yukon 
all the way up to Dawson City. So when you walk along our traditional trail now, you can still see these big cow skulls look like they belong in a aquarium tank. It's kind of neat. But this is a model that we're using to plan. And for my research, my my PhD, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about the significance of the fact that we can plan without interference from other parties. So we are the sole stakeholders of this land. I hate using the word stakeholder, but we're the sole title owner. So when I talk to a lot of my other planning, First Nations planning colleagues working on some of the regional plans, the ones that are so contentious, they spend all of their energy trying to explain to their colleagues the fact that land is worth so much more than money and what you can take. But in some regions that are heavy in, in mineral and staking potential, that is the only discussion many are willing to have, is, is where can we go and where can't we? But, you know, and it's hard to get all into all of it in this short half hour. Um, but we're in this really great position where we get to plan our way. Dan Ke. Dan means people, like the, the Southern Shoshone people, and Ke means path, our, our way, our path. We're able to plan solely based on, on our way and, and the, our, our values and make this, I wish to demonstrate and showcase how we make decisions about our land. So I wish to influence land planning policy. Um, this is the delegation that went to the Supreme Court in March 2017 this year. Um, some really lovely people in this picture, and uh, we're still awaiting that decision to see what's going to happen, and uh, it's going to be interesting because it's going to strongly influence what the future of land planning in the Yukon. But in the meantime, as First Nations people, we can sort of start to show that there's other ways to value the land than just what you can take. So a lot of it, you know, is our identity as First Nations people is strongly tied to the land. Those that struggle still with the intergenerational and the, I guess, hangover of residential school do well in the bush. I have, I have cousins, young cousins. I have, you know, one, he's been in and out of, of juvie. He's 19, 20, now he's 20. Um, you know, and he's just come out out of incarcer incarceration again. And he he struggles so, even in just like knowing who he is and what his purpose is. But when you put him out in the land or you put a drum in his hand, he just feels calm and he struggles with anger. Eh? And he he feels more at home. And I wish, I wish we could just give him more opportunity to be out there. But in their society today, you know, where we're here, we need to be institutionalized. I'm against nine to five work week. Um, I think it's really unhealthy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if we were to be able to move back to rebalancing a lifestyle a little bit, I think we would have much healthier people, a much healthier society and community. I wish my baby didn't have to go to baby care. <laughs> I wish she could be with her community members as we are when we're out at camp, right? Not just camp when we get it. So the land also brings ceremony. There are special places like Mount Dakota and it's Sasquatch Harbor. But uh, the other thing the land offers us is our self-determination. So as I said, this is an assertion. It's political. As much as you don't want it to be, it is. We're here trying to show a new way forward. I would like to call the market and the numeric system traditional. That's traditional knowledge. I want to involve how we make decisions, how we value, how we think about things in a more round way. Numbers are important, but to me, numbers complement. So in our land planning approach, it's purely based on what people say and have said. And then we'll complement that with some of the numbers. So YG, when they did their regional planning, they uh, brought all of their numbers of everything they knew about the land, all the vegetation numbers, past fires, mineral potential, and they put it on maps and they brought it to people and they said, what do you think? You know, and the people said, well, I don't know. This isn't how I view the land. We, you know, when I'm on the land, then I can tell you what I think about it. 
there, and we're not against development. That's the other thing. That's part of what self-determination is too. Is we're not against development. In fact, we wish for development, but we wish for it to be done in a in our way, in a way that benefits the future, in a way that allows longevity, in a way that promotes prosperity of the grandbabies of my grandbabies. Um, and there's ways to do that. So that's where I'd go into the, the maximum sustainable yield in the fish. Anyway, the other thing that I wish for our land plan to do is to promote reconciliation. It's a big hot word in Canada right now, but to me, reconciliation comes from the First Nations people, it needs to be driven by the First Nations people, and can be. Um, so something like a land plan, I would like for somebody from the Yukon government to pick up our plan and to, like, to have a better sense of who we are and why we make decisions and to realize that the land is not just about take. To realize that the land is about whole and future and you know and it, it's so hard to do it justice on, in words and paper and even as I speak to you I feel like I'm not quite hitting it about how much more it is and it's so 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 challenging for even me to overcome how to make decisions without a pie chart, without a map, but more just based on, you know, doing what's right for the future. And um, it sounds so fluffy and ad hoc that it gets discarded very quickly, but it shouldn't be. And um, I just, I'm hoping that through our document, um, we're going to be really creative and find a way to portray this message that's so going to take some crafting. So I'm at the beginning of this biz. I don't know. Maybe talk to me in two years and I'll have a better sense. Better words, better pictures for you that show show how we can be a bit more harmonious with our, with our fluctuating dynamic worlds. And then the other thing is, again, the future. Our intergenerational leadership. This is last year's graduating class. Um, that And I explained this to you earlier that my dad and the leaders, they instilled leadership in me. I hope to instill leadership in my daughter. And um, this is what I think is our greatest asset. Our greatest capacity is the fact that we are an entire society that is training leaders as a part of our culture and our way. And that is just who we are. And that is why we will drive forward and we will make big changes, I hope, right? So this is me and my baby speak gambling. That's, that's what I got for you. So Shonisan means, show means good. Nisan means I think. So I think good of you. Shonisan. Acknowledge my supervisor, Doug Clark, University of Saskatchewan. I live in the Yukon, Heather. <laughs> I don't spend any time in Saskatchewan, really, but um, Champion Ajax Lands and Heritage Department. And then I'm a Sanyi scholar. So they're very supportive of my work, too. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you. That was very, very interesting, very uh, deep immersion uh, in the very short time frame and with the limited possibilities of an online interaction, but very personal and both going into the history, but also in the reality and, and the future of what you experience and what your people experience in the Yukon and about land use planning and managing or how to how to run the place basically it's more than just land use planning from what I gathered but um, well I can ask you a very simple question just for maybe starters uh, just for understanding for anybody who's not totally up to date on this, you showed this example of the march to the Supreme Court. Can you maybe very briefly just give a, a, a 60 second background on why people went to the Supreme Court and uh, why this was the special occasion to do that? Yeah, so the, uh, the Peel watershed uh, has land use plan has proven incredibly contentious and uh, it's really come down to the integrity of our First Nations agreements and so the process has been ongoing for ooh, about 10 years and they came up, the, there's a commission, they came up with a final plan 
and um, presented it to the people and the Yukon government and the First Nations. And it had 80% conservation and 20% uh, development. And um, the First Nations with a heavy heart who wished for 100% development said, okay, well, you know, we will accept this plan because, um, you know, we are in the spirit of working together. But the Yukon government um, chose to, they're able to accept, reject, or modify the plan. And they, kind of, they chose to modify uh, the Yukon government of the day. And uh, it was probably one of the most controversial aspects of their entire leadership era. And uh, they, by modifying, what they essentially did was they took their own means and presented four more completely different plans that flipped it to 80% development and 20% conservation. And then they did a big engagement campaign online with um, the public to say which one do you think we should choose. And, but, so that First Nations and environmental groups sued them. That you can't do that. You, you can't just do your own planning thing in, in six months and say that these are the plans that you wish to present. Um, and so it was, they won in the Yukon Territorial Court, and then they lost a part. It was about where they could accept or reject the Yukon Territorial Government. So they lost in the Supreme Territorial Court, and now it's at the Canadian Supreme Court. And it's about where, it's about the process. Um, yeah, it's very, so the Supreme Court, the delegation that went there went in support of what is outlined in the umbrella final agreement and how we need to work together to plan. And we can't just silo or one party just can't do it on their own. It has to be collaborative. Great, great. Um, I think that's, that's a great uh, background and also leads to my next question right away because you talk about different ideas of development or land use and uh, the conflict between conservation and economic development. Now, just you personally, and it does not have to be basically the, the culmination of your research, just where you stand now on what, what you have experienced so far and seen so far, how would you define sustainable land use and uh, also in the next step then sustainable development. How do you view this? You hinted at this, you said something about uh, future generations, but maybe you can say this a little bit where you see basically the balancing there of using and conserving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my comprehensives was on sustainable development. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a challenging notion. And um, I do think that it is often, like, um, I'll talk about the fish quickly. <laughs> but because uh, that, that's a good demonstration, I think. So the fish are managed, uh, the salmon, uh, by maximum sustainable yield, which allows for a catch based on how much they feel they can take economically to benefit uh, fishermen. Um, and they allow so many through. And where we are, we're up basin at the very top. And uh, this year we saw no, no fish. We caught five. We caught five. My whole community. And um, they had DFO come to our community and talk to us while I was just there last week and talk about maximum sustainable yield. And they said that if we decided to um, create an economic opportunity, so we decided to harvest and, and sell our fish, they would allow more fish through. And so, but, right? And so instead of valuing the fish for what they give to the environment to their five-year life cycle and the fact that so many need to come through to spawn and then go back out, um, over a five-year period, that number isn't as important as whether or not we wish to make an economic benefit. And, but for us, the biggest benefit is the sustainability of the fish. And 
wanting the fish to still be there, wanting more than five fish to come to our watershed so we can be together as a community and show our children how to harvest. So, you know, I haven't harvested a fish personally for seven years, but I grew up harvesting fish. And uh, so my baby, you know, I hope she gets to harvest the fish. And to me, that's more important than us having a business. It's more sustainable than us having a business. But yet the term that they're using to manage is called the maximum sustainable yield. That's a, you know, I have a lot of thoughts about sustainable development. And I think it can be done in, in good ways. You know, for us, it's mining um, is the big one here in the Yukon. And I actually think mining has been very beneficial to the territory, and much of it is um, short-term sustainable. Like, I just, I get frustrated with timelines. They're all too short. Like, 25 years is, is peanuts in the long run. Um, I wish that in the Western world we thought longer than our own life, life span, but we don't. We don't see past, past 50 years in their plan. That's another question I would have because you talked about how until uh, 1942, 43, uh, the lifestyle was not sedentary, and um, and so also the the original concept of land use was not permanent, but this permanent flow more that you know things change and not segmenting a map into areas for specific uses and. So I wonder, do you think that these concepts of permanent versus temporary or flowing land use, are these compatible at all? And can there be a compromise? Because you mentioned there's co-managed land between your nation and the Yukon government. So how does this co-management co work? Does it actually is it is it uh, conflict free or is is there um, progress in that area? Mm -hmm. um, the will and self determination of the First Nations here is, is very strong, I guess, and uh, it's getting to the point where we don't need to argue. So we had the the generation that fought for the agreements is very like tough headed. <laughs> they they. Uh, they come with like their boxing gloves on to almost some of them do to almost all meetings because that was their day they had to really assert themselves but now for me my generation i definitely feel that there's a lot more room for for compromise i feel that people are certainly listening this era it's a good time to be first nations especially in the yukon the opportunity is is, is large and the ability to influence is strong and so that's why i think with this plan you know had i tried to present this 20 years ago, even, you know, 10 years ago, I think it would have been more challenging. But now I think it's, it's looked forward to um, seeing these new ways of doing things. And I think innovation is, is accepted at this point. And so I feel that there's good opportunity to try and make a difference. And, and the collaboration and the partnership is thought. It's not, it's not ideal in Canada anymore to be at be fighting First Nations, especially in the Yukon. Well, that's that's very good news. I think that's a um, mm -hmm. uh, good, good step in the right direction. We do have a few questions, and I think, uh, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't see who came first, so Heather, if you are still uh, ready to talk, otherwise I can read your question, but you can also ask your question. Yep, can you hear me? Way. Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the presentation. I learned a lot. And just on the topic of sustainable development, I was just wondering uh, what kind of economic development, um, are there any existing businesses or economic development corporations that are successful already in your community? And what kind of economic development ideas would you like to see your community um, pursuing? Mm -hmm. So in the Yukon, we have each First Nation has their own development corporation. We have numerous economic development opportunities. For example, uh, Air North, Yukon Air, Air, Yukon's airline, is owned by the Buntuk Wichita First Nation. Um, so we're at that level, airlines. And uh, you know, we have tons of conversations about 
um, potentially, if we wanted, we could seek partners to finance our own um, mining operations, like large-scale mine, if we wish, that would be developed and promoted within our own direction and guidelines. Um, there's always the smaller scale, so I hear a lot about the need for us to be back on the land. We've abandoned much of our land. So reinvigorating something like the trapping economy is something of interest to many people. We have an opportunity to do high-scale um, high scale resort uh, in Kalani National Park that would cater to like, extremely wealthy clients. Um, so economic opportunities are abound for us, really. It is an option of, of what it is we would like to pursue and how. And that's the thing, is um, if we have these high-scale clients coming to our territory, at least we're able to offer them an experience that you know, offers our perspective, our way about the land, and, you know, if they're going hunting or outfitting, for example, then they get to learn our aspects of respect for the animal that they are taking. So I would like to see my people, I would like to see the people that are being left behind have opportunity, um, for sure. I would like to see us maybe devote a little bit less to, um, or how do I word this? I I feel frustrated sometimes about the fact that we've kind of really fallen into the Western government model, which I, again, I, I, said, I alluded to earlier that I don't think it's healthy. I don't think nine to five work, work, work week is healthy, having to go to the office and leave your family. Um, and But in the government that we have adopted, we've adopted that system. And so I would like to see us sort of pursue some more innovative models of governance that allow better community connection and continuity. Yeah. yeah, and it's interesting because you have, of course, now with new technologies, we have totally new possibilities. Um, yeah, I work like, from home. <laughs> yeah. And, and you can you have e-voting so you don't you can have people participate in decision making from anywhere and and uh, you can have shared platforms like what we have here with the Arctic Summer College where people don't sit in the same room so mm -hmm. obviously there's there's new potential I hear um, some some um, David David had to leave already and before already um, Lisa had to leave. They said both said that they really enjoyed the presentation, and uh, we're sorry, but for conflicting schedules, they had to leave. So they couldn't say that in person anymore. But mm -hmm. I convey this. Um, I also heard the same thing from uh, Christy, who also said she didn't have a question per se, but she just wanted to say that this was a great presentation and she really enjoyed it. I hope I said that right, um, but I guess more or less that was the message, and I can only uh, mirror this. So this was really phenomenal, great, uh, great to have these deep insights. I I would suggest that if you, um, I mean, if if you want to share your slides with us. Um, and same thing uh, goes for Heather. If you are willing to share the slides, you can send them to me and I'll then create a PDF and upload it to the group. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of interest to have these slides, but of course, uh, absolutely your decision, uh, how you want to see them used. I'm just saying this here, think about it. Also, would be great to stay in touch, of course, with the group if there are follow-up questions coming over the next weeks. And uh, who knows? It, it's great to stay in touch. For the younger participants, it's a great opportunity, but also, you know, it's a relatively small network of Arctic-interested people. And um, it's, it's always a great pleasure to have them being in touch and communicate with each other. Jocelyn, if you want to have maybe um, closing remarks, not last words, but closing remarks for this session, and I would then um, just say a few more technical things at the very, very end, but if you, if you want to kind of 
end uh, your contribution here uh, for today at least. Mm -hmm. I think like part of what I'm proposing here is is so it's really hard for people to connect with. And the more that I present it to folks, the more that I am starting to understand that. Whereas for me, it seems like something so intuitive and real. And uh, when you have such different lifestyles from people, um, you know, it's interesting when you're trying to suggest a new way of doing things and a new way of, especially like numbers. I'm on like a hiatus against numbers. Um, but we're so comfortable in the system that, um, you know, it's going to be, not that I never want to not use numbers, but I just, I would rather place them down a notch. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I just look forward to more opportunities to share and to just start seeding some of these ideas. And, you know, I appreciate, I definitely appreciate the time. And, you know, if you ever get the opportunity to come to the Yukon or come even to, to the north, when you get to go there, there is a special air and a special beauty that, you know, sits with you and, and welcomes you and, you know, it's, it is very valuable and very real and important. So I'm glad to, that there's folks that are so interested and in wanting to learn more about, about our homes and our beauty. So, Absolutely. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I have the suspicion that these ideas and lessons, they can also be applied beyond the Yukon. Um, the idea of, of uh, maybe uh, re reassessing the value of numbers and, and uh, the blind trust in numbers, I would put it that way maybe, because we've seen mm -hmm. that in many instances. And we tend to nowadays in a lot of fields, and I'm an economist from my background, so there's this tendency, if there is a number, then that's kind of a, a, a it's a truth behind it, but numbers can be as deceiving as any qualitative statement. And I think we've all seen that with the financial crisis in 2008, that indeed uh, great models, great numbers are not always as solid as they pretend to be. And so that should humble all the numbers people a little bit and, and uh, make us consider your your um, your quest as more uh, more of an option, in, in, uh, but beyond that, we all look forward to coming to Yukon and uh, visiting you. And yeah. and Bern also says he agrees. Uh, I'm just going to read this because we're running out of time. But he says numbers tell one version of reality, and he says. Um, there are many ways to understand and participate in the beautiful world around us. Well, that's uh, mm. very, very beautiful at the end. So thank you. I want to thank you, Jocelyn, and also, of course, Heather, and great Heather that you could stay on until the end of this session. Just yeah. wanted to say thank you to both of you and to all the participants, but I want to say next week, exactly uh, one week after this session next Wednesday is our last session for this year's Arctic Summer College. And uh, we're going to have um, Alexei Tsikarev speak also on indigenous people, but um, coming more from the global level, uh, talking about the UN uh, indigenous peoples declaration and then coming uh, a little bit more from that structural organizational framework perspective onto it. Maybe interesting, Jocelyn, if you want to join that, you're uh, mm -hmm. welcome. Let me know. I'll give you a dial in if you want to watch that. And, uh, and then we're going to do a wrap up. And I still hope it's not 100% sure, but that we'll have Mike Fraga from the Wilson Center as well. He was scheduled for it. He's in Alaska already for a few weeks now, and uh, communications are a little bit um, challenging, but maybe, fingers crossed, maybe he'll make it. We'll definitely have at least one presentation next week and then the wrap-up session, and uh, also then opportunity to discuss and give feedback. So thank you to all of you. 
um, be it in the morning or the evening. Have a great rest of your day and see you next week then. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.